Hello guys, Hani Aum here, Ovaškande, uh, Shaq Dalma, or Analog Deer. And we're starting the third season for the Hani Home podcast. And Shaq today will be my guest. And I'm very honored because we tried to set up this podcast for a while <laughs> yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. But it's finally happening. It's finally happening. Awesome. So, so flattered about that. Hmm. So, Shaq. How was your day today? My day was pretty okay. I had a productive day, recorded some new stuff for some new analog deer tunes. I uh, headed over to the Bitbird office, which is always fun to see those guys again. It was a good day. I had some chocolate in between. Oh yeah. Nine out of ten. Nice. Yes. Why not ten? Can always be better. There can always be more chocolate. Where we should improve? Okay, chocolate. Chocolate, maybe, you know, uh, some red carpet when I enter sort of oh, the office, oh. you know, those kinds right. of things. Yeah, but, that's yeah. why we have intern for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Nice. It's always nice to receive a feedback from, so, <laughs> really constructive feedback. Um, so, Shag, um... I think at the point that it will be out, your new release slash cover will be out as well. So maybe you want to talk through about that. So why you decided to make a cover for that specific song? Or I suppose you can reveal what's the song as well. Yeah, exactly. So um, the next release will be a piano cover of Better Off Alone. And Better Off Alone was a, a Eurodance hit mm -hmm. by Alice DJ in uh, 1998 already. Yeah. The thing is, it's it's actually a, a, a re-release, but now sort of like the official route uh, through Spotify and iTunes and all the jazz, but it's already three years old. And I did it because I wanted to find a sort of like a connection between, you know, I three years ago I got sort of acquainted with Bitbird and with uh, Torvald and Sander and, you know, I had a few talks with them and... We were just trying to find like a, a, a sort of common ground mm -hmm. idea between EDM and, and uh, the stuff I was doing. So and then the idea came like, why don't you do a cover of something that nobody should really do a piano cover of? Yeah. Because it's so not obvious to do. So then I did that and, you know, it actually got then picked up quite well, you know, it got some, some plays on SoundCloud and some actually like a pretty big press coverage. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it was time to release this sort of for real now. Yeah. But it's like three years. Yeah. It was a while. So, 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 why, do think now? Like, so yeah. why do you think now? Well, the, the thing is, um, I, you know, it was already on my mind for a few years. Um, but I thought that it was more complex than it was to, you know, offer it through an official route. And um, um, uh, apparently, whether that it's like a, a new technology thing that is happening now, or it just like uh, got into my mind's eye, but it's actually quite easy to release a cover at this point, which you can officially distribute and mm -hmm. like with the whole thing properly set up legally as well. Okay. Yeah. So that was the main incentive. I just saw that that could be possible and. Uh, but besides that, so you were just kind of afraid it will be taken down, or uh, it may yeah. probably the main reason. Yeah, I think that's the main reason, of course. Like, if I'm doing such a thing on, you know, a Spotify where you get some sort of monetization, then it needs to be constructed, right? Yeah. You know, um, but uh, I'm happy that it uh, it could be. It's cool. Yeah, it's cool. So. You mentioned that you only were at Beatbird, like, you know, Beatbird for three years for, for now. Yeah, three, four years, I think, yeah. at this point. So, like, 2015. So, yeah. basically, when it just started. Exactly. Cool. So, how did you find out about guys? Like, I, usually, so what I know, the story, like, from Torvald, how, how he told me how Beatbird appeared. Mm -hmm. So, it would all start with just SoundCloud channel. Was your route to find out about Beatbird the same, or did you just met them somewhere in person? Like, what was well, the story? Yeah, exactly. So, the, the funny thing is that um, Analog Deer, for me as a project, is already seven years old already. 
So and at one time I was making more indie orientated stuff, like more you know real band stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to take that live to the stage, and um, I needed a drummer. And so a friend of mine said that I needed to contact Tim Bista. Mm -hmm. I live here, which I did. Um, and then I got acquainted with Tim, and through Tim also with Sander, who was, I think at that point, just making you know his first baby steps with uh, Bitbird and, and Son Holo. Mm -hmm. Still doing mainly, I think, even the Kazi Lo-Fi thing at that point. Um, so I got in contact with Tim, we did a few gigs together, and I was, uh, uh, at the same time, I was sort of releasing, self-releasing an EP, and I heard Sun's stuff as Kazi Lo-Fi, and I thought like, wow, this sounds amazing. I need to get my EP mastered by Sun, because I was, uh, I, I became aware that he was also mastering other people's projects. Mm -hmm. So I contacted him um, and he mastered my project and then a few months later, you know, I saw the Bitbird thing picking up and uh, getting, uh, you know, some, uh, some uh, momentum. And then at one point he contacted me saying like, hey, I really like, like your stuff uh, from your EP and, um, you know, would you like to do something with Bitbird or I think one of the first things I did was uh, the B song remix mm -hmm. from the Trip EP, which also just got released yeah. last year. Yeah. So that also took a while, but that was one of the first things. And then, you know, at that point, there was still a distinction. They wanted to have a distinction between EDM oriented stuff and uh, acoustic stuff mm -hmm. that had Bitbird level two. And yeah, they had a like a, a separate account, SoundCloud account, and then they reposted some stuff from me on that account and then mm -hmm. sort of you know it, i i saw that tracks could you know gain 10k plays instead oh, yeah. of one <laughs> or two yeah, yeah, yeah. because my mom listened to it you know and then it it, it it we we built from there i think and it it actually it it took a while still before i had my shit together and you know realized what i want and uh, so it I think it took a year and a half after that before I released my first proper thing on uh, on Bitbird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was story we tell ourselves. Yeah, exactly that uh, that EP. Yeah, you know, it just took me a while to figure it out, and and I think you know, Sander and Toro were always pushing me as a pianist or trying to sort of push me as a pianist. But yeah, when I first got acquainted with them, I. I was doing other stuff and I, I really tried to do the, the vocal thing and the more the band orientated thing, I don't know. And it I, I realized it quite late that you know, the piano is the thing where where I'm good at. Yeah. But it's also I don't know how that's for you, but the thing you're good at is also the first thing you tend to forget because it comes so natural to you. Yeah. So I was looking at this while I should have been looking at the piano, you know? So it took me a while, but um, here I am. I think, yeah, I'm making sort of strides now um, as a pianist more. I'm trying to, you know, put some focus there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Even with your latest release. Was exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool, but well, why don't you add your vocals there? Are that, that terrible or it's or you just seem like it doesn't really fit usually to use vocals with this kind of music you're releasing? I, I do tend to use, uh, a lot of vocals actually, but usually it's just humming or just wordless sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just more used as an instrument. Um, and then I think it's fine. You know, I don't perform live at all actually as Analog Deer. So I'm fine with using my vocals as crappy as it is in the background, yeah. just as a layer. But as a sort of main thing, it's definitely not strong enough. Okay. And, you know, it took me two EPs to realize that. And a few gigs where I felt horrible because I I can't sing for shit live, you mm -hmm. know? And I it, it it took me a while to figure that out. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Well so but why not to use something like attitude or just like yeah, it wouldn't just really fit. That's what you mean that what you main reason not to use vocals. Your your whole vocal like singing something. Well 
Of course, yeah, of course. Like you can use auto tune. Like I, of course, I already use auto tune on yeah. the tracks. Mm -hmm. Like, but that's mainly an efficiency thing. Like I don't want to record five hours of vocals just for that one perfect take. You know, yeah. that's just an efficiency thing. But live, of course, you can also use auto tune. But you know, and look, there as a live project, I never found a way to to make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, either it was too small or I thought too big. I don't know. I, I, I could never make it work. So like the whole process of trying to find out how to do those vocals live with auto tune and all, it, it, it's no use. At, it, at this point, it's super obvious to me that and look there will probably never be a live project. Um, and that is totally fine. But why so why don't like have you so you you tried you you also yeah. tried to make some gigs yeah like exactly audience and all this stuff but why primarily I because i uh, my, my happy place is just being like in my bed <laughs> in my basement <laughs> oh yeah in my studio uh just making music you know and putting music out and and producing stuff and the, the moments on stage where I felt happiness were far like a few in between like usually I'm I'm yeah I'm not that much at ease on a stage especially if it's my own project like mm -hmm. if I just play for someone else then it's totally fine mm -hmm. but as Enlo dear I just I, I no I'm not in my happy zone there Okay. And the funny thing is, of course, that as a musician, especially as a mu musician that came from a, a musician background as opposed to a producer background, you tend to think that gigging is, is part of it. Yeah. It needs to be part of it. And of course, like I think that you, you make it sort of harder on yourself if you don't do gigs. To you know, gain some 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 momentum, but it's not it's not necessary. You know, there are other ways to make your project sort of happen. Yeah, and you know, the gigging thing is one part of that. And um, yeah, you know, I'm still sometimes I'm still undecisive about it, but right now I'm just happy with how it is, and uh, maybe. You know, if the right opportunity will arise and with the right people, it could work beautiful on the stage. But mm -hmm. right now, it's it's fine as it is. Cool. Yeah. So besides just making music, I also like making music for yourself. I also doing something like scoring, let's say, for some other people like projects. I would love to do that more. I have done a few things like. I did a documentary and a few short movies mm -hmm. um, and that's super fun and that's yeah that's super fun I would love to do that more um, didn't really yeah put much focus on there to be honest like all the focus the last year and a half were really on like building or trying to build and look dear more mm -hmm. um, yeah but that's definitely a fun thing to explore more because mm -hmm. that's, I think, you know, the, the music I make is um, definitely, uh, you know, suitable for that kind of stuff. It is, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a quite obvious sort of, you know, connection. Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe I should, um, you know, refocus on that. Yeah, it, it's like... I am not here to give you any mm. advice on building the project because I just also I've never been an artist and I've never been in your uh, shoes, so to say. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't know. Yeah, but it's good. It yeah. sort of makes me also think about certain you know things. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's good. It's cool. So, um, you already mentioned your basement. <laughs> yeah. And I, I I mean I love that you made some kind of um, part of your image already that you person who always sits in the basement <laughs> with his robe yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know i a bit messy and just doing exactly his work. exactly like the the funny thing is that came from you know i'm i'm ancient i'm 33 year old 
years old. And, you know, I, I lived in an era where there was no internet, yeah. you know, so like the whole social media thing never came sort of natural to me. And I never really liked it as well. And, you know, I had some talks with uh, Bitbird about that and it became sort of blatantly obvious that if you want, if you want to make it easier for yourself, you have to, you know, play that game, whether you like it or not. And so I tried to, from 2018, January, I thought like, okay, so I need to at least try this. I hated it. I, 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 you know, I never liked to show my face on something or, and I thought, okay, I just, I'm going to try it and uh, see if it works. And then at one point, of course, you see that it works, your engagement sort of starts climbing and your sort of audience and people, you know, start met message, messaging, or oh, what a word, you and, you know, and then at one point you start having fun with it. But at the same time, I'm also aware that, you know, I'm past my sort of, I'm past a certain insecurity that I want to show myself more prettier or, you know, better than I am. So mm -hmm. I am that guy that is always in his basement making music with a robe on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can't make any more out of that. So why not show that and, you know, uh, uh, with it show a little authenticity, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, I didn't know you before we actually sync Matt for even Bitbird Talks like yeah. that closely. So yeah. I, we never really talk exactly. like during maybe some events. Yeah, yeah just high exactly. and that's it. But I, I saw that you also like that. You seem to be enjoying the process of creating the joke out of your basement. Yeah, system, exactly, like exactly. of course, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's of course, it sort of gets um, memeified or like over exaggerated yeah. a bit but um, I'm having fun with that because that's also you know that's actually sort of like a, a counterbalance almost to you know, I'm, I'm making quite serious music it's always yes. a bit sad and a bit sort of you know melancholic and um, I'm not necessarily like that as a person you know I also have my sort of weird as meme-esque uh, personality going on so I just yeah. you know try to get everything that is me involved somehow in my social media outlet. Yeah, because it was so grotesque when <laughs> you made the stories with Yvette, when you made the new track and you were all like speaking about stuff on stories. Yeah, you yeah. were always make, trying to make a joke out of every question. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. it was like, wait, this guy is like playing pretty serious music in yeah. classical <laughs> exactly, way. Exactly. So like, yeah. 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 But that's like, a, I, I, I love contrast like that sort of uh, also in other artists um, like uh, one that comes to mind um, do you know Chili Gonzalez yeah yeah exactly he also has that sort of going on you know he has this sort of uh, uh, he is obviously a very knowledgeable and like a real a true pianist in the, in, the, in the pure sense of the word but he's also a, a, a jokester and he also makes connections to from Bach to hip hop yeah. and you know find common ground there and give sort of like master classes in those so like I, I love that sort of that contrast and um, yeah I think that can exist sort of next to each other in one person yeah and sure it's cool you know so you so what are the other like things that can be counterbalanced with your so you are still your music like the weird stuff that you do on not daily basis, but I'll say like a weird hobby or whatever. So do you have any any of this? <laughs> do I have a weird hobby? I just wondered. Yeah. Well, the truth be told, like most of my time goes in my music and with that, like this whole social media thing. Um, I'm a huge cinephile, like I'm really a movie lover. And, you know, I do these huge sort of bulk retrospects of then I go to like a uh, Lars von Trier or a Stanley Kubrick and watch their whole oeuvres and mm -hmm. diving into like uh, the noir sort of uh, new wave cinema or whatever you know I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. really a movie lover in that sense so that's the only real thing next to music I'm doing mm -hmm. and then like 
there's only a couple of hours in a day so my day is already filled with those two things yeah. I actually you know sometimes I think about it I would love to do more like I I would love to read more I would love to write actually I would love to you know dive into other things but there's simply not enough time I already feel there's not enough time to be to become like the best version of like the music musician I could be mm-hmm. in this lifetime and you know to think about other things is it's almost overwhelming to me like yeah I tend to stick to two things then yeah. just the movies and the music all right yeah. so how did you decide music to be a life pass was it just natural for you to do music all your life or no not at all actually like I started at 15 um, so I'd a, I'd, I had a whole lifetime without music before that and I was actually like doing martial arts oh. uh, karate and kung fu and at a pretty high level as well and I was training seven days a week and I did some break dancing even like I was a really sort of a fit yeah kid but it, you know at one point I started I was fed up with it and a friend of mine picked up a guitar and started learning some songs and I thought like wow this is this is so e- easy you know you pick a song you spend a week on it and then you can play the song it's mm-hmm. super like concrete you can okay let's do Nirvana now and then you can cross that off within a week and then you go to the next song it, it seems super like hands-on to me mm-hmm. so I wanted also to you know I was in the market for a new hobby, so to speak. So yeah, I thought, yeah. like, okay, well, he's doing a guitar, and I want to play drums. And then I asked my parents what they thought of that, and uh, they, of course, hated the idea. So they said, like, no, 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 no drums. But uh, there's still like uh, an old keyboard laying around. So uh, just take that and see how that goes. So I started out on a super tiny kid's uh, keyboard, and then you know, I. Uh, I started doing music and you know I started at 15 and already as well like taking lessons and from the get-go I was super serious about it but I was also aware of I was super classically orientated back then and I, I you know I was aware that most people that that are pianists in the classical sense um, of the word you know started at five six and I do believe that certain aspects of playing need to be ingrained from an early stage in life just like ballet or something you know Mm -hmm. and that's also with learning an instrument and i missed that whole thing Um, so it was just a gradual gradual shift from wanting to be a classical concert pianist to becoming more you know pop orientated and then jazz came along and uh, the more movie orientated stuff but I think I was aware of that I wanted to make it a profession at, you know, at 17 already or something. Mm-hmm. And back then it was, of course, only a wish. But yeah, from uh, I was serious about it from the, the day I started doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, but you still mentioned it that it started as a hobby. Yeah. And then you just decided to go further. Yeah, of course. Like, uh, yeah, of course. So it started as a hobby, and I had some, you know, I had lessons from a really cool, crazy pianist that, you know, also got me acquainted with classical music and mm-hmm. just going in depth in in that. And uh, I'm still super grateful for that. But of course, like um, the moment it got really serious when was when I went to study at the Pop Academy. Mm-hmm. Um, then you make a sort of conscious decision like okay it, if I do this for four years you know <laughs> yeah um, then I uh, then I'm making my profession out of it or at least like I have the ambition to so yeah I did the pop academy um, in uh, Rotterdam which I didn't finish actually me and I tend to be a bit St- uh, I don't know if stubborn is the right word, but um, rebel maybe a bit. Like I have a thing with authority, in a sense that mm-hmm. I, I I question some things, and 
the school system was not meant for me, <laughs> just to put it like that. Okay. So I dropped out and, uh, you know, I don't regret, regret that at all. Like I, I learned some great things there and, you know, I got a, a network there of buddies that are also still musicians. So it was a good time. Mm. But, um, and the fact that I don't have a, a thing to prove it, it, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. Because, you know, in the end, nobody is asking Sun Hollow for his... Uh, Diploma. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that else is true, of course. Yeah. yeah. So you also tried to start a bunch of incentives on YouTube. Yeah. So you started like memoirs. Exactly. Like this. Yeah. But it was one and only. <laughs> <video>. <laughs> yeah, memoirs. Yeah. What's I, re happening? I remember that one. Yeah. Okay. So it was the idea to do that on a monthly basis or even like a, a bi weekly basis. Yeah. But actually, like, okay, so we did the first one and uh, I was pretty set up for the second one. But then I came to the realization that you have like four different uh, agendas that need to be aligned. <laughs> so, you know, everyone is busy. I get that. So, yeah, it didn't happen. We actually, we shot the second one. Hmm. So maybe it, it just becomes a yearly thing. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> also something. So there were several people working on the project because on the video, it was you, there was a vocalist, like the girl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I like the, the concept of memoirs was just to show the music uh, in, a, in a, a bit of a different light. So that song uh, from Memoirs 1 is like a vocal only track uh, on the studio version. And now we did it just with the piano. So, you know, you mm. shed a different light on the same song. But it's going to like, so I just wanted to know more about the concept that st yeah. stood behind. Like, even though it didn't turn out to be a full series of it, but still I want not to know. Yet. Yeah, not <laughs> yet, not yet. We don't know yet. So, um, so was it mainly uh, trying to play different versions of your own songs? Or was it also going to be covers or like... Or you didn't really think about it that far? No, it was, it, uh, at first I thought of also including covers, but um, yeah, I think I had some talks with Torvald about it, and then it was clear that I would only be doing originals. Um, but just like, you know, what I said, just shedding a different light on, uh, on the track. But, you know, it's logistics, logistics, man, between people that are busy. That's exactly also what I hated about being in a band. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the fun of it gets blown away from me immediately because there are logistics. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then the, almost the focus comes to lie on that thing. And then that's why it was actually one of the main reasons why I started Endless Beer, just to get rid of that. Of the band. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had a band, you know, a few bands, of course, before that. And while it is fun, it's also, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's intense. It's, it's hard work, of course. And to get everyone aligned to the sort of same headspace is super difficult. I found it too difficult. So, um, at least like with Antelope Deer, I can, I also, Maybe I'm not this, the, the fastest worker or the most efficient, but you know, at the end of the day, I can look myself in the eye and think, you're an asshole because you didn't do this or this today, yeah. as opposed to, I hate that guy in my band, but I can't really do anything about it because he is him. And you know, just the, I'm self-reliant mm -hmm. and I love that yeah. sort of, that I'm sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm the only one. You know, be the only one to blame. If exactly. Doesn't go. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I I do that enough, you know. But uh, that's perfectly fine. But to rely on someone else, I find that difficult. Of course, it's always difficult. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Um. You also shoot a really beautiful clip, like the video clip for the Obrecht. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that was my first. Um, you know, my first venture into sort of like that whole thing and doing yeah. a thing like that sort of like professionally so that was that was uh, heaps of fun um so who worked on the concept of weed yeah yeah so we got uh joris beards uh, oh. he also did i think wake the warrior for dulu 
Or he worked on that. Yeah, he was involved, I think. Yeah. yeah, maybe not the concept because that was hanged. But anyway, he worked on that and um, we got him aboard. And I think the concept was pretty yeah, clear from the get-go or something. Mm-hmm. And But of course, like even because it's a super small concept in that sense, you know. Yeah. And even that takes like uh, quite some effort, of course, to like get together with all the people that are involved with the lighting and all the you know the props have to be sort of uh yeah uh, fixed and uh the grand piano had to be sort of rented and Mm -hmm. at the end of the day there's still like a lot of things that you know need to happen for something like that but i'm super happy with the result and um yeah would also love to do that more but i do realize you know even like the cheapest video clip is already a few k yeah if you want to do something properly. So, um, yeah, I am actually like for the Ghoulian Finch three track, I am going to do a video with a buddy of mine, just more like a low key, no budget video clip, but yeah. just, you know, to give a little bit more weight to the, to the, to the song. That's good. Yeah. So, uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, maybe it will be another level, but still like it's, it's yeah, something, yeah. you know, people can look at. So, Sure. Yeah, because it's not always that you need to spend that much. No. Even though, like in in the regular concept of the music video, yeah. yes. But I know that for a Cecily face for Sun, like Torvald just bought a filter on his exactly. iPhone, and that was it. And that was it. <laughs> yes. And I find that the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful clips there are. Like there is. Yeah. That um, one. Yeah. No, definitely. That's definitely right. But if you like do it with a team, then of course, like just the 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 fact that there are 10 people working on it already says that it's going to be expensive. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, it doesn't even matter what you're doing. Yeah, because you know what they say, so usually, as you also a film lover, I'm not sure whether you spotted it or not, but whenever a director gets a smaller budget, it makes him to think of the sinks in a different concept, so like it may, have, may make the film better and more interesting to see to watch in some sort of a sense if you have a smaller budget if you have a smaller budget um, sure. at least there is some kind of a uh, idea there is yeah like, of course about that yeah i mean I, I, it, it could probably work both ways but i do think that of course like if you have to work yourself around the budget creatively then like beautiful things can happen yeah and also like i don't know do you know uh, the director michel gondry he directed Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and oh, uh, yeah. Be Kind Rewind. Um, he also made some beautiful sort of, I don't know, dreamlike scenes with no budget and just like with foam and all kinds of weird stuff that you find around the house, but done in a really charming way. Yeah. And it sort of works beautifully. And um, that's a, a beautiful example of that, actually, I think. Because if you would have had access to CGI, yeah, you know, it would it, most likely spoil. Exactly. It's all. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, what do you think? Uh, being called analog deer, um, some of the filmmakers actually shooting with analog film. Does area does it actually bring some more charm into the in the into the movie, or it doesn't really matter in the end? I'm not sure whether you ever thought about that, but I'm just, I just well, decided I, to bring it up. Exactly. I do think, like, I, I recently saw Argo for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the story is set in the 70s. And I, the first thing I noticed actually was the picture quality. It was so, you know, reminiscent of the 70s, sort mm-hmm. of in a way. And then I found out on IMDb that they uh, just uh, recorded digitally, but they blew up the image 200% to show the grain in it. Sick. Exactly. It, it, you know, it looked super natural in that sense, but I do think it's a it's a kind of charm. But at the other end of the spectrum, I'm I'm I hate uh, new movies that are shot so crisp and so fluid with the, like the 4K and or the 8K sort of technology, and uh, that movies lose their cinematic quality and start to look like documentaries. Do you oh. notice that? If you like, I don't know, like with um, 
the the first like movie that 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 I saw that sort of uh, uh, made it clear was the Hobbit trilogy mm -hmm. that was shot like super crisp and super fluid, and of course like all movies prior to like a certain age were always shot in 24 frames per second and there's a certain motion blur with 24 frames per yeah. second yeah, yeah and if you of course shoot in 48 or 60 or even like 120 then you lose that motion blur and things look crisper but also more natural and thus less cinematic yeah i feel i see so it those new movies take me out of the experience because they just look they they don't look as visually appealing to me as older movies Hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I like I, yeah, I I want to snap out of it, but I can sort of. <laughs> so yeah, no, for so me, you know, the new technology is working backwards for me in an aesthetic sense. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because I love that the actual technology is there. Like also, like you talked about the Bandersnatch. Yeah. I watched that on a on a 4K TV, like this big, and the image was so crisp. It was beautiful. Yeah. Like, wow, that's another level where they shot it. So that was like there was an instance where I sort of could enjoy it, but usually it takes me out of the cinematic experience. Really? Yeah. I don't know how that's for you, but yeah, I never thought about it this way. Like, I'm probably more of a gamer rather than person who like watching films. Exactly. Because that's why for me, like, usually all the graphics are kind of crisp in this sort of sense. Yeah. So they are at least trying to make to make it look like it more of a real life exactly. experience. Exactly. So probably that's why I couldn't really, like, I find it appealing sometimes and it brings some charm when you watching a movie about, like, older ages, maybe, like, last century, 70s, 80s, whatsoever. Yeah, but I wouldn't say that it's ruining the cinematic scene mm -hmm. for me. But that's an interesting point, no, yeah. about this this way. Yeah. Well, I can imagine that as a gamer, it's like a different kind of cookie, of course, because the whole... You know, the last time I gamed was with the PlayStation 2, I think. Really gamed. Oh, so, yeah. So, like, they lost me a long time ago. <laughs> but <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah, exactly. If I met a buddy and, like, he is, like, playing, uh, what are the kids calling it these days? Uh, Red Dead Redemption, I think. That's me, I'm playing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. That looks amazing, you know? It is. <laughs> for me, I didn't see anything for the past 15 years on graphics, sort of. Uh, terms so that looks amazing of course and then yeah I don't know but do you have the same nostalgic feel for uh, lesser graphics or like older consoles to be or honest I don't okay because like newer newer graphics bring this cinematic feel so to say yeah of course so, so like it's kind of computer gaming trying to go after the more cinematic yeah. image yeah exactly so that's why it's starting to look like you playing kind of interactive movie again yeah exactly that's what i like the most i mean i don't mind if the game is good i don't mind like looking at the worst graphics yeah because i'm like i personally more to care about the story exactly um rather than experience yeah or whatever exactly but, so I, you know the, the the games that are being released these days are insane uh, in storytelling and in music like everything it's probably the most immersive um, thing there is you know everything's everything comes together in a game yeah like there's interactivity there's of course like the movie the cinematic element there's music yeah it's crazy so why don't you just start playing exactly games? like like I, I told you I would love to I would love to dive into that but there's but, no time or no, of I mean, course like, there's, there's always time yeah I mean like substitute movies with games a bit or something yeah, like this yeah exactly exactly it's just a matter of priorities okay I think you know and uh, yeah I tend to be a person that if I dive into something I want to do it good and I sort of really do it so then I would rather not if I know I can't spend like the hours on it okay yeah but still like I'm sometimes jealous when I see my buddies you know playing beautiful stuff <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> jealous yeah I, I don't know <laughs> but uh you know I'm just sitting on the couch and watching it it's also fine whatever all right when did your artist alias came from come from in what <laughs> like what is analog dear why there's not you know there's no story behind it no sort of 
deeper. It just sounded funny. I think, you know, back then I think I was still at the stage where I thought like your name was like everything and it needed to be unique and it needed to... So I, I went through 50 other sort of project names, I think, until okay. I decided on Antelope Deer. Um, and the funny thing is then like, because I was so happy that I finally found something I was sort of, sort of happy with, I immediately bought antelopedeer.com. And then I realized, oh wait, there's a guy called Lonely Deer which is a hero of mine and our music actually sort of is resemblant of each other. <laughs> but then I already bought like the, yeah, the website or how do you call it? Um, so, you know, then I had to stick with it. But now like, it doesn't matter. It's it just a matter. name, you know, it's just a name. It is. So there should there be like comma after analog comma dear. Well, Lonely Deer had a comma in between, yeah. and then at one point he sort of got rid of it. I never did the comma because uh, that was blatantly obvious yeah. copying, sort of. Okay. So I just lost the comma, and then I thought, this is original again. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, because I, I usually wonder about that. So was it maybe... Uh, so you already mentioned that you kind of ancient from ancient times. So yeah. maybe like analog in this case. So like seven years ago, you thought like, okay, I need to think of something which is kind of. So oh, it's yeah, curious. Yeah. We're in a digital age, so I need to be analog. Oh yeah, exactly, exactly. But yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But I don't know. Like in that sense, I don't know if I'm nostalgic per se. Are you? I'm not at all. Still, um, no. Sometimes. I guess. Yeah, of course, like to like uh, times where you maybe like. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I would say I kind of grew when the internet was already there. So, um, because, yeah. yeah. But that's also funny to me. Like, it's super interesting that your nostalgia is, is different, of course, than yeah. uh, mine. But that's, of course, like a generational thing that happens always. But still, like. In this sort of technology driven driven thing now it, it is a different sort of experience i would say um yeah but no it didn't came from sort of like that nostalgic uh me sort of trying to it just sounded cool it just sounded cool that's cool i mean i know every artist who might ask about their alias I never heard the story. It was always yeah. it was just sounded cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. people, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, because I personally trying to oversync everything. And if I would came up with some artist LS, if oh, I yeah. was the music, exactly. I would be like, why am I chosen? Exactly. This? So why am I called like this? What would people think about that? You know? Exactly. Yeah. But it's of course like you're working on a novel, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you would probably like write out a concept behind the name you chose. Yeah, <laughs> I, I will definitely create the story even if there is yeah. there wasn't one. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but is that how it works? How's it coming along, by the way? The novel. Um, I finished twenty third chapter. Damn, two weeks ago. Wow. So I'm a bit more than hundred pages, A four pages. So yeah. it's like two hundred oh, pages yeah. of book format. Damn. Do you yeah. already have the end in mind or? Yeah, I have the ending in mind and I'm trying to now fix all the, because I have four storylines which now needs ah, to be tied in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm like, yeah, I'm just procrastinating, unfortunately. Like, do you have this scene when you see a really big task in front of you and just trying to procrastinate, even yeah. though you, you can work on it? Yeah. I know you need just to work. Ah, that's only, that's only human. Man, I think everyone has that. But what what worked for me is um, I I encountered that actually like in the last few months because I used to give a lot of piano lessons and that was mainly my day. And then I had a few hours left to do like the analog deer stuff. And now the you know the focus has shifted more to analog deer. And I and sometimes I have weeks where I have a few lessons or every week actually like I have a few scattered lessons and. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is free time. I can do whatever I want. 
And then of course, like you have really have to look at yourself and intrinsically motivate yourself to, you know, make the most of the day. Yeah. But what, what works for me now is of course, like it's super obvious, but to make sizable chunks of it. Like if I try to eat the whole cake and want to go, that that's not going to happen. But yeah, of course. you know, if I sort of take a little thingy and the, it's always a matter of, you know, putting in the work and, um, um, taking it in your case word by word yeah that's how the thing you know get, gets built up and then at one point you have a novel sort of yeah and if you like I, I have the same thing with if i start thinking about i want to do another ep this year mm -hmm. or maybe even a bigger ep like five six tracks if i start thinking about that now i already get stressed like oh man six tracks that's such a lot of work but yeah. it, it starts with you actually it starts with me going to Tim this evening to record some piano, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. wherever that may take sure. you. It's all so. starting with a small step. Exactly. You just need to make it. That's the thing. This is the hardest, yeah. <laughs> usually. Yeah. But I don't know how that's for you, but usually when I sort of, okay, go over the sort of edge and start working, then you get in the flow and then you can work for hours yeah. on end. Yes. But you have to like first drag yourself in that oh, space. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I and have that can be super hard. Yeah. I, uh, I'm i with you. Yeah. Because, uh, like, for me, I don't know how it is for you, but you mainly, so to say, uh, you have this kind of floor, or you at least saying that you have it, that you're always in your basement. Because for me, it's so hard to work from home. Okay. Like, I'm getting so much distracted by anything. Yeah. Like, someone texted me, or I decided to turn on TV, or whatever. Exactly. So I usually just trying to go somewhere where I couldn't do anything but just work. That's so funny because I have the I have the exact same opposite. Hmm. I, sometimes if I don't need a piano or something, I also go to a cafe and try to work there. It doesn't work for me really? because I'm so used to an environment which is completely my own and where there's no um, yeah no distractions at all apart from you know your phone that sort of yeah. lights up but just having all those people around me i don't know like i i was all, always a bit of a it's just a character thing always a bit of a loner but still i do realize that since i've been working from home mm -hmm. that yeah i tend to be more uh, how do you call it um more focused more productive no more um damn i lost the word more intact with what you're doing more no that was distracted the, the, the distracted exactly so i can take less from my environment sort of so so to say okay yeah because yeah i, I get distracted by people and like yeah i don't know because I'm just not used to it anymore. I think. Yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah. But you know, whatever works, it works uh, different for everyone, and that's fine. Yeah. But um, you know, if you can do the work in a cafe, then go to a cafe. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have my favorite spot already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So that's a cool thing. <laughs> I suppose we are close to the end. Cool. Well, you already asked me a bunch of stuff, but still, the very last thing I ask you to ask me something. All right. Um, how did, did you get in touch with um, Heroic and Big Bird? Um, it wasn't such an exciting story. I was finishing my university in Rotterdam. Like, I studied an RSM master program. I studied an RSM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was looking for internship slash work, if it's possible. Like I wanted to go straight to work, not without any internships. I see. And unfortunately, I didn't have any work experience, so it was a bit trickier for me as well. Um, so of course, I was looking for all these banks, corporations, everything, because usually what that's what you get on the job board of university. Yeah. Uh, and then there was just this message from Heroic, like, we're looking, we're a small startup company, up to 10 people. And I was like, wow, it's so cool. Music industry, what? Why? I never thought about this. Yeah. And I came to the interview, I spoke with Booty, we had like two hour talk 
just about stuff it was cool. really cool like it was a really great interview like i don't think we ever had such a long interview now like yeah we usually limit it up to one hour yeah, or exactly well it was really exciting cool. then we had another one and uh, yeah i had a bunch of other offers which didn't really turn mm-hmm. out and i thought like hey those were really suck so it's probably really good and destiny helps me to choose a good company and i'm really That's glad so cool. i'm here yeah sub question did your music listening behavior change? Yes, changed a lot. Like I used to listen mostly to indie slash rock. Yeah. Now it's only 90, 90%, 90% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. No, I mean like, um, yeah, like I really am enjoying listening to album one. Yeah. Because this is also less EDM, more indie. Exactly which I like really well. Yeah. I like your stuff and I think Obrecht was one of the first songs from Beatbird which I saved to my Spotify library. I'm honored. Yes. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Like with also this um, humming, like using voice yeah, as an instrument was yeah. so, so enjoyable to listen to. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. And of course, sometimes I can also listen to this ED electronic bangers, yeah, of course. but it happens once a month. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But it's sure. Yeah. Cool. It's funny. And are you more aware of, I don't know, like sort of you, you work in the music industry, you know, yeah. are you more aware of, I don't know, if you see a certain Spotify ad or aware of your musical surroundings, do you know what I sort of try to ask? Like, I don't know, because of course, like your life is sort of interweaved now with, you know, the music business. So maybe like there's more, you know, things that, uh yeah around you happening in, in music that so do i start to follow like what's happening in the music industry yeah or sure or maybe, maybe even like before heroic came along uh you weren't even thinking about like working in the music industry oh no, no. i never thought about that of course exactly yeah because all the creative industries for me it was something cool, yeah. But it wasn't something which kind of my studies were concentrated exactly. on, of course. Because yeah, yeah I'm mostly my biggest dream was to become a trader because oh, it was yeah. the easiest way to make money. Yeah, only because of this. <laughs> um, and yeah, because like my main idea to go study in finance was I well study finance. Usually, I salaries are better in finance sector. So just go get a good job and I'll just do my hobby of writing. And yeah. then at some point I'll exactly. just quit. Yeah. But now it's it's now all changed. Yeah, it's yeah, all exactly. changed. Yeah. Because the work I, I do is starting to be more enjoyable, even yeah. though sometimes it can be boring, obviously. But of course. Yeah. It's always. It's mostly about the environment yeah. and atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Funny how life sort of takes you on that road or oh, something, yeah. you know? And it uh, sometimes can be such a roller coaster. Yeah. It's always a pleasant ride. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. My, My pleasure. pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was a real joy to talk. Likewise. <laughs> Likewise. Cool. Bye, people.